Okay, we are live. This is the first episode of the marketing series. Super pumped about it. Christy Lee, Nourishing Food Marketing. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Mark. I am very pleased to be here. I'm pleased too. We are going to focus on marketing in CPG. This is going to be an interesting one. Let's get right into the idea of marketing as far as food and beverage. What are the first few things that you think about when you hear marketing in CPG? Mm -hmm. I think marketing in CPG is one, being the voice of the consumer. So developing products that really meet consumer needs, talking about them in a way that consumers understand and making sure that they are at a price point that makes sense for them in store. The other big piece of marketing that I'm sure many of your listeners uh, care about is um, making sure that product flies off shelves. That's the other big piece of uh, marketing, driving awareness and driving trial. So there's lots to marketing as there are to lots of topics, but those are the two big key ones for CPGs. I like that a lot. Let's then talk about packaging. Do you believe that there, there is something said about your packaging needing to be at peak, you know, peak levels, peak performance, peak viewers, and people for, for it to move at the highest in terms of velocity versus one? Again, it's kind of like, well, of course it should be, but like, what's your take on packaging in general? Yeah, packaging is your number one marketing asset. Every single one of your consumers sees it. So it absolutely has to be at peak performance if your business objective is to sell as much product as possible. However, if your business objective is to test and learn and understand what your product positioning is, for example, so many of our products are gluten-free or clean ingredients or um, you know, sourced from this beautiful farm in Nicaragua, um, then your, your packaging doesn't have to be top notch because instead of just trying to move product, you're trying to understand to learn so that you can move product later. And so that could be a situation in which you have packaging at a farmer's market or your local retailer that really love you so that you can test and learn that um, and, and see uh, what really resonates with consumers. That is an amazing answer. And it's interesting that I've never even thought about it like that because any, most who would be watching this would just think, I need to have the most epic looking packaging on shelf, which you could kind of do like everybody's done it. They go to their category, they walk the shelf, they take multiple pictures, <laughs> and then the, the good ones, like they throw it up on a board and they say, how are we going to be differentiated here? Colors, patterns, fonts, right? But you bring up something really important is often you may not even know who is your core consumer? So it might need to be just big, gluten-free across the front rather than low sugar. Touch on that one more time though. Like, have you seen that, experience that where those changes and, and sort of uh, concepts like are, are practiced? Yeah, and I think that packaging is always a journey. You should never do your packaging and then like feel like you can put a bow on it and it's done. Um, you know, it, it, we always are learning from our consumers. We are listening to them. And so as we, uh, you know, get bigger and, ha you know, broaden our consumer target um, and reach more people, that's another opportunity or aperture for packaging to change. So I think that one, there's figuring out what your positioning is, what your key benefit is, and why and how you're fulfilling that for your consumers. What's that reason to believe so that they believe that your benefit exists um, and wanting to uh, communicate that with your consumers, your positioning and testing that. That's one thing. But then there's also as your brand evolves, your product evolves, you go from natural to conventional grocery. You go from your core product line to product line extensions. Your, your positioning probably will change a little bit. And so your packaging should reflect that. So packaging is never, it's always a, think of it as a chalkboard. It's always changing. 
This is going to be an interesting question. I think you can answer it, but we're just going to call it out. Let's talk about one brand. No, not one brand. Shout out one brand. Um, let's talk about a brand uh, that comes to mind for someone like you. Why do you believe it's a success? What have they done that has created something in your mind where you go, they totally get it? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Oh, uh, I will use two examples here. Okay. Um, and both of them are ones that we all know and love. Um, one brand is Nike. I think they really get it. I think that last year when the Black Lives Matter movement um, was happening, they released just amazing marketing assets to say, actually, sometimes don't just do it. And here are the situations in which that is. And I think that they really live their brand values and responded quickly to a situation that um, was contextually important in America and just societally important for us to talk about. Um, another example I have to give is the brand Dove. Um, Dove has done amazing things um, to really bolster like girls' self-esteem and women um, beauty and to redefine that through their advertising. And I think that both of these brands have used their incredible brand megaphones to talk about things that are beyond their products. That's what a great brand is. It's beyond your product. It's not like the bag of snacks. It's like, what does I want organics stand for that's beyond that? And I think that Nike and Dove, of course, they are legacy brands that have a long time to do this. So new brands have a hard time doing this, but I think they're really good examples of how these brands have, uh, have really lived their brand values. I think that's fair. I mean, some would say, well, there's been around for so long, like you're saying their legacy, but it's funny, um, even you mentioning Dove right away, I I'm not a Dove purchaser, but like, I, I do get a sense of calming when I think of, of that brand. And that just means they continue to do the right things. And, and we, it, it's like, it could be naive or it's not, but the reality is there's a lot of newcomers. There's a lot of you know emerging brands. There's a lot of founders who have a purpose and who are willing to go compete with them, right? For real reasons. They're foundationally, they've got principles that maybe um, maybe are aligned with that, what they've done, but maybe they have smarter new concepts that they can bring in. But I still think of Dub when I walk by the aisle and I'm like, that's just an amazing brand. And the big one, I'm sure you would attest to this, is trust. Mm -hmm. I trust them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the same way that I, my kid just bought, we bought her, you know, Nikes yesterday. Um, I, again, like, it, so anyway, shout out Nike. Uh, you don't need that, by the way. Um, let's, let's maybe talk about a brand that you're, maybe that you're working on now. What do you think are elements um, of things that they're doing? Maybe is the founder relationship, um, are, are they, uh, uh, is the founder um, involved in the marketing? And how important do you think that is? Uh, yeah, a great example is Moonshot. It's the U America's first climate-friendly snack brand. Um, it launched in December of last year. So it, you know, I hope that a lot of your viewers can relate to that because we're a really new brand. Um, and the founder is heavily involved in the marketing. Um, that doesn't mean that she doesn't delegate and have me, you know, lead the charge um, and come back to her with feedback. But she looks at every single social media post that we go out with because the brand is her. She's the founder. It is her, um, as much as her own son is, it's her child. So um, I think that for some brands, that's true. I think for others, when you have a more technical uh, benefit that the founder themselves don't have a strong personal story, I think that's different. But for Moonshot particularly, um, Julia, the founder, is 100% involved in marketing decisions um, and asset approvals. But again, she allows me to sort of write the creative brief, understand what the marketing strategy is, uh, you know, execute that with our marketing partners, and then she gets involved. So there's a uh, she be becomes involved, but it's on a light touch way so that she can do everything else that she needs to do. Okay, that is that is fair. Um, 
I got a topic for you that I know you'll have an answer with or, or on. Um, what about as far as a marketing team or if you're involved or if there's a head, you know, CMO of a, of a brand, do you think that they should be looking around at other brands in their category and talking about them often? Or do you like the mindset of a pure on tunnel? Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't mind saying this. I talk about this with, with a, a friend of mine, Adam, what up? Um, we, he, he thinks I'm binary. I didn't even had to look up that word um, <laughs> because I do this. I don't care what anybody else is doing. Sometimes people like forward me stuff. I'm like, I don't even care. Sorry. I get emotional about it. Um, because what the, my, the foundation here, right. And everything that we do, it is, I've, I'm very adamant about it. It's, it's comes from me. It's, it's out of me. It's my why it's my purpose. Balanced nutrition. It's what I do is I don't need, I don't even, I don't need inspiration from anybody. And it's not because I'm not like fair to it or I'll respect the other brands, whatever. It's a, whatever. But there's some in marketing who are like, oh, you're doing yourself a disservice. You got to be looking around and da, da, da. Give us your take on that. My take on that is it's good to know what your competition is doing because they have probably thought through something or done some consumer research and are testing something. And you can learn from that. Um, that's not to say that that should change what you do, but that should help impact and think about and shape that. Um, one piece that you mentioned is, should you as a brand talk about your competitors? And I think the answer to that is it depends. And it depends on your brand voice and who your brand's enemy is. Um, brands don't often talk about their enemies in public to their consumers, but it often helps them shape who they are and what they stand for. And I think a really good example of this is Impossible Foods. I would say that their voice is... Uh, has a negative uh, impact to it. Like they want other brands and other people to stand up and make a difference and stop eating meat because that is the worst thing in the world. That's what they believe. And so they talk about their competitors because that's how they've created their brand DNA and their voice. Um, most brands are not like that. Most brands are po more positive. Uh, but I think that's a good example to sort of think about and challenge our beliefs about how we think about our competitors and how we talk about them. God, that's such an amazing answer. Um, there's a couple people, because now that you say that, um, there's a couple players like in the snacking space that do that too. They call out some of the legacy stuff. I never understood it. Um, but again, that's also because I'm a little more transparent in that I don't have an issue with the legacy brands. I, I jokingly say like, you know, Tony the Tiger, like from, you know, Kellogg's and like Frost, like, like, I don't really have a problem with that product because they, they have emotionally connected in a way that, that provides joy to people. And that is part of our DNA. It's part of my DNA, right? Mm -hmm. I want people to feel good. The thing is the fact that they're higher in sugar and that they may not be as healthy as other, other brands or products in the set, that's a different story. And I could talk on that too. Um, but, you know, but, I, but I'd also in the same breath say, I can point out 10 other products that you think are healthier than that, and they're not. Mm -hmm. so, I, you know, dude, what a great, I love that. Um, I love your answer on that. Let's go into, I could, by the way, I like these short and choppy, but these could go forever. Um, let's go into uh, brand messaging and communication. Who's leading that? Uh, is that also the voice of the founder at first? And can it be handed over to someone who goes, all right, Mark, I know how you talk, right? I got, I'll take it from here. And then should it be looked at and, you know, consistently sort of be um, confirmed and approved before things go out? Um, I think it depends on what stage you are in your brand. 
Um, my advice to new brands is to set the guidelines up so you know what your copy should sound like. You know what the guidelines are. You know where the sort of tricky balances are in talking about your brand. And then be consistent in who is writing your, your, your copy or doing your graphics so that your messaging is consistent across all of your assets. That's the number one mistake I see brands do. You know, you see something and then you see another thing, you're like, how are those related? And so being consistent is really important. But the founder, the founder has so many things to do. Um, they can review things at the, the, at the end of, the, of um, the asset creation process, but I think that only really matters for things that have lasting value. I don't want my founder reviewing stories for Instagram that last for 24 hours. I don't want her reviewing newsletters that are in people's inboxes for less than a minute. Um, those things I've got. If you have someone that you trust to um, represent the brand and you've aligned on those guidelines and have those tools set up, then you don't need the founder involved in every single asset. But I do need her involved in our sell sheet and our packaging because that is a critical uh, for our brand. Uh, I, I, I'm going to just say this because I always do. These the last like I know there's only 15 minutes, but like this last like six minutes, I'm sitting here and listening to you, and I'm just like, and I'm saying, Christy totally gets this <laughs> and is delivering value to me. Like I'm literally just sitting here and I'm soaking it all up. I just got to say, I really love everything that you just said. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. I think that comes a lot from my experience. I worked in Big CBG. I worked at Clorox on their food brands, really Americana, like Hidden Valley Ranch. I founded my own uh, brands myself, and now I'm a consultant to brands. So I've sort of seen it from a lot of different perspectives. So it means a lot to me, Mark, that you say that. Well, and you can, again, I, I get it. Uh, and, and because of that, and the way you're communicating and the things that you just said, um, I, I always say it's like kind of like matter of fact. There's matter of fact, and then it has like actual substance to it. And, and, it's, and it's real, and it was. Uh, so if you saw this right now, I really hope you rewind that stuff because uh, I'm going to. Uh, Christy Lee, uh, thank you for joining the first episode. Be well, be healthy, have a great rest of the week. Thank you, Mark, you as well.